Welcome to Pirate Living Podcast. We are your hosts, Kristen and Karan. On this podcast, we are highlighting ordinary people living extraordinary lives. These are pirates who take small, bold actions daily to create social change. Pirate life is all about rebelling and breaking the rules for good. Creating lasting social change starts by first breaking our inner rules. After all, the hardest rules to break are your own. The pirate, pirates we highlight have dedicated themselves to creating good trouble. Today we're talking once again with Francisca Elmer. Francisca is a marine biologist and climate pirate who we chatted with all the way back in episode 19. So if you haven't checked out that episode yet, please go back, have a listen to Francisca's story, her work with sargasm and her climate activism. And we are really excited to catch up with Francisca and hear all about what she has been up to this past year and a half. So Francisca, we're happy to be talking with you again today. And I can't believe it has been like a year and a half since (laughs) we last chatted with you. So why don't you tell us how you've been and catch us up with uh, what you've been up to? Yeah, I'm I'm good. I've been good. I've been very busy in the last year and a half. Uh, What all happened? Well, (laughs) a year and a half ago, I was still working only part time at Seafields, a company who is trying to do carbon sequestration with the sargassum algae. And then uh, beginning of last year, I started a full time position there as scientific project manager so I'm managing all our field trips or most of them and yeah it's it's very busy very exciting to to see how can we use this amazing algae to capture carbon Um, so it's very much still a research and development project Um, it's the first time I'm working for a startup so that's quite different from working for like universities and NGOs but very exciting. Um, And similarly to my previous jobs, I have to wear a lot of hats Mm -hmm. depending on what kind of work comes in. Um, Because of course we are a small team and everybody has to do a bit of everything. I've also been very active last year in Scientist Rebellion, which last time we talked, I I was already part of. Um, Scientist Rebellion has grown a lot last year. So we've we've gone from a small group that is scattered around the globe to you know a few hundred people to a few thousand people, and um, it changed quite a lot the how how Scientist Rebellion runs, and we also started getting funding. Mm. So yeah, we went from having no money to managing. Um, budgets of like a hundred to uh, two hundred thousand dollars. So I I somehow slivered into being part of the funding group and managing that. And oh, it was a lot of work. So mm-hmm. even though I did most of my work was in the background because there isn't a, a an active big group here in Playa del Carmen, I was extremely busy with Scientist Rebellion, just making sure that everything works and that we can get actions done anywhere. That we can get our African um, delegates to COP27 in Egypt to yeah and to make actions happen in countries where you need to send them money before the action so that they can can do it because not every um, group has has personal funds to to pay for the action and then get reimbursed so mm-hmm. it was it was a big challenge um, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So it sounds like we have a lot to like catch up with. Mm -hmm. So I want to dive into (laughs) like all of those things. So uh, let's start with your work with the uh, with the startup and with sargasm. Um, So you said you're still in Playa del Carmen. So that was gonna be my first question. Where are you (laughs) these days? Um, What kind of uh, like progress or development has happened since we last talked and maybe just talk For those that haven't listened to your episode, just talk briefly about the work that you're doing uh, down there. Yeah, so I live in Playa del Carmen, which is in the Caribbean side of Mexico. And here we have a huge problem with the algae called sargassum or sargasso or sargassus, depending on the language you talk. And it's an algae that arrives on our beaches and it just comes en masse. So 
Um, there's people cleaning the beaches almost 24 seven, just to make sure that the beach is clean. Um, and sometimes it arrives in such much quantities that it's not, it's not possible to clean it all. And then you have this stinking mass that is like knee high or hip high and the water gets brown and it's not nice to go swimming. It's not good for the seagrass, the corals, uh, the mangroves nearby. And yeah, it affects tourism as well as local enjoyment of the beach and economy and fishermen. So it's it's a huge problem in the Caribbean, not just in Mexico. And I started researching this algae back in 2018 um, when I was first on an island that had this algae problem happening. The problem has been around since about 2011 when um, some of the algae that's normally in the Sargasso Sea and has been there for centuries has um, escaped. And now there's a completely different belt of Sargasso that hasn't been there um, in the tropical Atlantic that goes from Mexico all the way to Africa. So that belt is since 2011 new. Some years it's stronger, some years it's um, not as strong. This year it has started really early. So the season, as we call it, has already started um, January, February. Normally mm. we have a few months in winter where there's not much sargassum, mm. but we've had quite a lot um, recently. So that's a bit of background of what sargassum is. And um, since, yeah, about a year and a half, a bit longer, I've been working for this startup called Seafields which is based on the idea of an emeritus professor to use sargassum for carbon sequestration. His vision is this really big farm or, or um, comp complex of farms in the middle of the Atlantic where the sargassum grows. And then the sargassum that is grown can be either used for products or can be sunk to the deep sea. And the CO2 that the sargassum takes up when it grows is locked either in the deep sea for thousands of years or is put into products that last a long time, such as um, the plastics in your cars, and therefore is locked in there as well. Because at the moment, the sargassum does take up CO2, but then when it gets on the beach, it releases that back into the atmosphere again. Mm -hmm. So by sinking it, which it naturally also does, but we want to sink more of it than it naturally does, mm -hmm. we could potentially really get a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. So would that be like creating basically another Sargasso Sea? Kind of like yes. what's already there, like in the more North Atlantic? One. Yeah, yeah so there's one. one there's one in the North Atlantic and it's... Mm -hmm. um, the only sea without land border because it's bordered by currents that, that go in a circle. So that keeps it in. And that works really well, except in 2010, 2011, when those currents were not very strong and the sargassum escaped mm -hmm. and created this sargassum belt that we is now making so many problems. But what we want to do is take the gyre, so the circular... Um, current system that is in the south of the Atlantic where there's no sargassum and put our farms in there and our farms would have a, a type of a paddock or barrier around them to keep it in that helps us to to harvest so we don't have to drive around finding it in a big in a big area and and use a lot of petrol or or energy to do it and it also creates another barrier of making sure it doesn't escape into a place where it then um, is is beaching and pro, uh, making problems. Because sargassum, when it's in the ocean, it's a great habitat for a lot of animals. And it's very beneficial. It's just when it's beaching that it becomes mm -hmm. this problem I just talked about. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly from last time we talked, when it's in these like more tropical, warmer waters, it, it grows faster as mm -hmm. well, right? Yes. So it needs um, the light and the temperature helps. And also in some areas, such as the belt that we have, there's a lot of upwelling and also 
rivers like the Amazon and the Congo coming in and the Orinoco and they bring nutrients. So mm -hmm. it has the nutrients to grow. It has the light. It has the temperature. Um, where we want to go in the, um, in the South Atlantic gyre, there is not that much nutrients, but we want to upwell the nutrients mm -hmm. or take them out of the sargassum and use the nutrients from the sargassum to fertilize the sargassum again. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of products are you making out of it when you do harvest it? I mean, you mentioned plastics yeah. and stuff, but mm -hmm. so how does that work? So where I'm working for the, the company, we are working on figuring out how to farm it because mm -hmm. there's not many people who are looking into how to farm it. And there's lots of companies that have developed products, mm -hmm. but they need to have like they need to have far farms will help them to get big clients in for their products because then they can say we can definitely provide you with this much sargassum or this much of our product um you know this year which now with natural occurrence you just never know how much you get in a year so but in terms of products that other people are doing um that goes from vegan leather emulsifiers so things you put in face creams um, a lot of different types of fertilizers and biostimulants that are also acting as a fertilizer for for plant growth um, to paper um, people are making shoes out of it so like making um, this people do 3d printing they add it to concrete or to clay to make blocks and houses and all kinds of stuff out of it um you can free you can make soaps as well really good soaps so yeah and then we are working um we have a grant together with a company who who's working on different products to look at how can we make plastics that um in the pr price segment are comparable to to um the plastics that are used now mm. And so how will the farming of it like disrupt the belt that's like, and the, the issue on the beaches and stuff? How does that work together? Yeah, so the farming itself will not disrupt the belt. So the belt mm -hmm. will stay where it is. It's extremely difficult to, to just get rid of this belt because even though it's a lot of sargassum, it's very spread. Um, but at the moment, um, as I said, the, the companies who are using the, the stargasm that comes to the beaches for products, they have a problem to, one of the problems for scaling up is that they don't know how much they can, they can get every year. And a farm would help them to scale um, higher or bigger mm -hmm. and have the security that if there isn't that much coming, that it can be grown mm -hmm. um, and it can be provided, the, the biomass can be provided to them. So from the belt, you would, would you be harvesting like first from the belt and then the farm would be back up? Is that the idea for it or? Yes. So okay. um, for products, you would harvest from the belt first, mm -hmm. mainly also, it's cheap. It's probably going to be cheaper or same price as doing harvesting from the farm. Mm -hmm. And also you want, it's hard to t like to start a farm while there is a problem with something, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot like, I think the social acceptance and the government permits will not come in if you say, we want to make a sargassum farm. And they say, well, what about the stuff that comes to the beaches? Oh, well, that we don't care about that. So <laughs> I think it has to be that, yes, we take the stuff from the beaches first for products. Mm. And if there's not enough, we will use the farm. Mm. But there's the beauty of sinking the sargassum for carbon credits, because that is a, a product where, you know, if you have a, a big year or a big supply or, or a really heavy week, coming in and you cannot make products there's just too much sargassum coming in or or nobody needs the sargassum from your farms then you can sink those the, that sargassum 
and create carbon credits that then you can sell later on and you can sell it online or, or it's, a digi- it's a digital thing you're selling, right? Mm-hmm. Carbon credit is not something you actually have in your hand. So that can really help with that market as well To mm-hmm. If there's a lot, you just make more carbon credits. So how, how do you think it? Hell yeah. Yeah. I've end, been end of that. yeah. How do you think it? <laughs> no, that, that's a really good question because it's it's actually the only algae that that floats on its own and that always that isn't attached on the sea bottom. So as a as an algae, it is floating until it gets really old and the, the little bubbles or air bladders um start stop working for them and start um bursting. So how do you sink it is, is a good question. You have to burst those air bladders and there's different ways to do it. If you sink the sargassum deep enough, the air bladders will burst from the pressure. So about 100, 120 meters, it will burst within seconds. If you put it down to 30 meters, you need a few hours um, to burst them. So that is a way. We actually decided we want to process it with machines also to get some um, some liquid out of it and to get some of the nutrients out of it because we can use those nutrients if we are working close to shore. We can use those nutrients and sell them as fertilizers. And once we start working out in the open ocean, we can bring those nutrients back into the sargassum farm and don't need to to have very expensive upwelling pipes. So um, we really want to get as many nutrients out of the sargassum as possible. And um, in that process, we are bursting the bubbles. And then we make bales like a hay bale and sink them. And by taking out the nutrients, it will also um, not decompose as easily in the deep sea. So it will stay down there much longer um, as well. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, what equipment do you need to make it into a bale like a hay bale? I'm trying to picture this. Now. I'm picturing like little like scuba divers <laughs> popping them underneath, pop, 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 like um, bubble wrap. But <laughs> yeah, I mean you can you can do that, but you know um, we def- we're definitely gonna um, take it out of the water. And um, there's different bales you can make. So there are some machines that are made for like. Um, boats to to crush um, waste so those are like it doesn't then look like a hay bale it's more like a square bale but looks more like a bale of of cans or of cardboard that you maybe have seen Mm -hmm. and there's actually a company in Finland who who used the normal hay baling machine or Mm -hmm. um, the ones you see with the with the plastic wrapped around the round ones and they they bailed, they made a bail out of sargassum. So they're now testing it every few months. They're taking a sample to see how does it stay? Like, does it stay fresh in there? What, what does it look like? So That's there's cool. different options. Uh-huh. It's very cool. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Do you have any other questions about sargassum and prison? Um no, I mean, <laughs> it's uh, I love getting caught up on what's happening yeah. with it because yeah, when yeah, when last time we talked was um, the potential for it to go into plastics, and now even just in a year and a half, so much has changed. So I love that. Um, cool. Mm-hmm. So I want to catch up on what's going on with Scientific Rebellion. Yes. Since so we last talk, I started following them on like social media and like getting a much better sense of like what they're doing. Um, but yeah, why don't you tell us what like the organization is all about and what kind of stuff um, you're doing to uh, create trouble, create good trouble? Yeah. So the organization is is all about um, scientists being climate activists. So as a scientist, um, you know, we are reading all the papers, all the scientific literature of what is actually happening out there. And, um, and then we, as scientists, the, the climate scientists at least, they have communicated what is happening with, with the government, with, with anybody, with the public, right? And they have rang the alarm 
and still nothing is really happening well something is happening but way too little way too slow and um part of it is because those scientists you know they 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 give in their reports they and then they just go back to doing scientists work right they do they're not out on the streets they're not actually acting like this is an emergency so how is the public gonna believe them and their reports that this is an emergency if they're just sitting at their desk writing papers and and doing more research which of course is also what we need when when it is an emergency but it just doesn't seem that plausible mm. so scientists rebellion is this amazing organization that brings together scientists who who see the climate and the biodiversity crisis we have as an emergency and don't just want to sit at their desks and do science they want to be seen and they want this to be seen as an emergency and they are willing to go on the streets and they're willing to do civil disobedience and to really show hey this is a real emergency and we really have to do something and so what kind of like civil disobedience um, are you doing to grab the attention? Um, so Scientist Rebellion does a lot of um, the civil disobedience, like um, where we glue ourselves to the streets. Um, yeah, like we have um, blocked the whole um, um, bridges before, but it's also very dependent on country. So we, we are very strong in Europe and also um, a little bit strong in America, in the, in, the, in the United States. And there, of course, you can do these types of things. So you can lock yourself to a bank or to a, to a building of a company that, that um, does things that shouldn't be done in terms of the climate emergency and, and get arrested and you're probably not going to get beaten up badly or or killed by the police, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then we also have very active groups in Africa and South America. And there, the repercussions for these types of actions are much, much stronger. Mm -hmm. So there we have more like marches and educational projects as well, because we also know that in these areas, actually a lot of people are not well informed about climate change so there's also education that needs to be done in order to actually mobilize people to to um to go on the streets for climate change um so yeah it really depends on on the place mm -hmm. so i think you kind of answered the question but how do you decide um, if you're in like Europe or, or in uh, the US, like who you're going to chain yourself to, or mm. like how do you decide where these actions should be taking place to create the most impact? Yes. Um, so mostly it's the local groups who can decide what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we, we normally have like certain like dates. We say, hey, that week we want to do actions. And then the local groups decide what they want to do. And sometimes, like last um, September, October, we had a really big action in Germany. So, or several actions in Germany, and there, every like people from all Europe came there. So that was then more not just a decision from um, Scientist Rebellion Germany, but Scientist Rebellion Europe, or yeah, like everybody involved there was strategically deciding what do we want to do where do we want to act um what kind of demands do we want to have and yeah we we also sometimes get help from from people who are like known better about communications and media and and stra strategy because it's a lot about okay what does the public right now care about mm -hmm. and what kind of um actions and demands would go better with what they care about or not like do you see that there will be support for this or will because will there be no support for this at all like we had the energy crisis in europe or looming energy crisis in europe last fall 
Mm-hmm. So we decided to focus on cars and car industry and private jets instead of um, focusing on on shutting down coal power plants or something like that, because I think people would have not understood mm-hmm. um, us doing those types of actions. And what are the like impacts that you're seeing of the work that you're doing? Uh, I mean, there's lots of impacts. Um, you can see like political impacts. You can see the media talking about climate change, talking about our actions. Um, so those are like the bigger impacts, which of course you never know if like France talks about, okay, we're going to ban private jets soon. If that is due p- because we did actions a few weeks ago, or mm-hmm. if it has nothing to do with our actions, but hopefully our actions help to do that. And then you also have personal impacts like a friend of mine when she first got arrested um, after um, being on a bridge in Glasgow and and um, and blocking that bridge um, suddenly her family and friends were like wait so this climate change thing is really serious then if you mm-hmm. just got arrested and and they they realized that what she's doing as a climate activist isn't just a hobby of hers but they they started asking her about how bad is it. Mm-hmm. So it you know it it also shows the people around you that you really that it is really serious and mm-hmm. and that you seeing how what you are willing to give up for it. Mm-hmm. Last time we talked to, we were talking about the the climate clock um, and how many years were on it and how COVID for had helped a little bit. But I'm curious. Has that picked back up um, like to what it was previous COVID time um, or has all this, has the talk and the activism helped slow down the time on the clock? I don't think it has slowed down. I mean, mm-hmm. during COVID we had less emissions, but the mm-hmm. emissions have been going up. And I mean, since 2019, we should slash emiss- emissions by 7.5% each year. So, mm-hmm. you know, 2021, we should have slashed it um, another 75 from what we did during COVID. Mm-hmm. So the COVID year is actually the only one where we slashed it, but we slashed it by staying home. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a slash that we also taking over to 2020 unless we also stayed home and we didn't, right? Or 2021 where we didn't stay home. So, and I mean, we cannot just keep staying home longer and longer and that's not, not how we want to do this. Um, so no, it has picked up. And um, just last week was the climate um, Fridays for Future climate protests all over the world. And at least in Switzerland, the big news was, oh, within like, it was like eight, eight towns or nine towns that have protests. And in each of them, they had a few hundred to maybe a thousand people coming. And at the height in like 2019, we had a hundred thousand people or more in the streets. So the climate movement has really shrunk a lot because COVID and the Ukraine war are more in people's minds are more in the media. And it's surprising because Switzerland had a very um, severe drought last summer and has now a severe drought in winter. Mm. We've had almost no snow for skiing and we already worried about next summer. And even though that the news about the, the weather and how climate change is affecting our weather has been omnipresent in summer and quite present now in winter, mm-hmm. it doesn't make the movement stronger. Like it doesn't add people to the movement right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting that there is a decline when, I mean, I know here and I can speak for Vancouver, like, every year is like the hottest summer and even hotter than the last one and even more hotter. And like, it feels like you can actually feel the change like every year after year. And you would think that that would mobilize more people um, into protesting and and creating action rather than less. Yeah. I mean, I'm also surprised. Uh, First of all, I think, Switzerland is getting affected faster than I thought it would. 
even though I, I think I have a more realistic or more pessimistic view of what's actually going to happen, while well, most people don't, it isn't communicated to most people how, how fast, how bad it can get, right? Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, yeah, we don't have people coming into the movement. I think back in 2019 with Greta, there was a real, the movement was 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 starting. People had energy, young people had energy, and it was a movement that is growing, which always attracts people, right? If you have mm -hmm. something that's growing. And then they didn't get listened to. And so after a year or so of the movement not getting listened to, it's it's hard. Some people will will say, okay, I tried this, it didn't work. And then COVID came and Ukraine war came. So now I think especially the young people are dealing with a lot of things already and are maybe just don't have the energy to also mm -hmm. do climate protests. So they gave up on it because they said it didn't mo mo work. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. more people doing civil disobedience now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's easy to give up on things when you think they're not working or nobody's yeah. listening. Mm -hmm. well, and movements, yeah, yeah it, it takes years and years of, mm -hmm. of doing movements for them to to have um, effects. So it's it's quite normal for movements to ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. um, I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about the, uh, the US package. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Um, like there are new climate change. I know it was called something else like recovery. Inflation. Laws. Inflation <laughs> recovery package. Uh, um, why don't, can you tell us, and uh, what I've heard is that it's, good it's just a little too little too late um even though it's like the i guess the biggest um uh kind of environmental package that they've ever had um but i'd love to get your thoughts on it as well yeah i mean the package came about a year ago so i haven't mm -hmm. followed exactly what happened with it but i remember when it came out one of the things I found very interesting is that it still allows new um, fossil fuel exploration and drilling. Yeah. And that just doesn't make sense. Like they they kind of made a deal, I guess, with the fossil fuel lobby saying, oh, we, we put in these new laws for renewables to help renewables. But at the same time, we want to help the old energy sources as well. Mm -hmm. And and that just doesn't show your attention, right? Like it's like, oh, I'm gonna go on a diet and I'm gonna go shopping and I'm gonna get all these healthy foods. And then just before you go to the counter, you're like, oh, but let's let's also buy some chocolate and chips just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that that's a great analogy because mm -hmm. I don't know, you know what you're gonna reach for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, okay. I wanted to, uh, talk a little bit about COP27 as well. Um, so you said you guys had delegates from Africa yes. that you had sent from Scientific Re uh, Rebellion. So, uh, I'd love to get your idea, your, your thoughts on it. Um, and like, what was the, some of the experience that your delegates had and your overall yeah. thoughts? So I think it was quite a different cop from once before so from an activist view it was almost impossible to do actions outside like it was very repressive and um so i think what our delegates did which was like a few marches or standing with placates was like as little as you could do mm -hmm. but it was the first cop that focused on loss and damages mm -hmm. So this is money that the wealthy, rich countries, which put out most of the CO2, have to put in a pot so that the countries like Pakistan, who who had major floods this year, could have money to, to rebuild, mm -hmm. to pay for their loss and damages, which weren't caused by their emissions because their emissions are tiny. Mm -hmm. So there has been some some work on this. But yeah, as usual, it's just very little done and yeah too little too late is I think mm -hmm. the buzzword in climate right and from what I've heard and I want to know your answer I think I know the answer when they agree uh, like you know whatever COP26 that this is what 
countries are going to do. Um, what's the like follow up to make sure these things are getting done that we that are agreed upon? Yeah, um, so countries have to like, so for what happens at COP is since COP um, in Paris, which was COP 15 or so, no, I don't know which number, but the COP in Paris was the one which had the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. So there it was agreed that countries can put their own targets for the next five years. And then next uh, after five years, they have to ratchet down. So that's what they had to do in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So they had to make better targets. And they also have to check, I think every few years, it gets checked if they get, if they're working towards their targets. Mm -hmm. If they don't, it's not like they get a fine or anything. It's, it's all voluntarily. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's, that's one of the problems, right? You, there's no, for, there's nothing bad happening to you if you don't reach your target. Except yeah, there's no change. enforcement. And yeah. there's no enforcement yeah, other than climate change itself. Yeah. Um, so, so a cop in Glasgow, they were supposed to put new targets. And it was seen that the, tar the new targets they put are still only half of what we have to do to, to get to what, what the IPCC report told us, how fast we have to reduce by 2030 to half our emissions. Mm -hmm. So they did ask people to come with new targets to COP27 in Egypt, and almost nobody did. So we are still like the targets we have set we will only get us to half of the goal which we have to reach by 2030 and then when you see the local policies in countries at least for switzerland where i know but also i know other countries are the same then those local policies aren't even made to reach the targets they set so we're not going to reach it unless we change our course mm -hmm. and take this more seriously and so do you is there like um a sense of what percentage of countries are meeting their going to meet their targets never mind the like real goal that we should be but the targets they said um i'm not sure i think climate tracker the website would be the best place to look at that mm -hmm. so they okay. they are looking at people's uh, a country's targets and what, what they need to do to reduce and if they meet the targets how much reduction happens and if they don't meet the targets but I don't know how many are actually meeting their own targets. I know from the Climate Tracker website that I think there's only one or two countries, if even, it changes all the time, whose targets are actually in line with the um, Paris goal of 1.5 degrees of warming only. Mm -hmm. So most countries do have to have um, stricter targets anyways whether or not they're actually meeting their targets. And is that one point is when are we like scheduled to hit that 1.5 degree of warming? Yeah. Yeah. In a few years. And then what is the impact of hitting that in a few years? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good question. It's not like the 1.5 is like, this this door that you go through and like a tipping uh, point yeah it's, it's yeah. May, it may be a tipping point but it's it's i mean the the climate model in our earth is a very complex thing so mm -hmm. um the higher the temperature gets the more is the likelihood that we we'd hit some tipping points where there's a no return like it's like when you boil an egg and once it's boiled, you cannot have an unboiled egg. So that mm -hmm. that's that type of stuff can happen to our poles and to you know the ice in the poles in the polar regions. It can happen to the coral reefs that the coral reef is gone, to the permafrost, to the um, Amazon and and other um, forests. And it's it's a very it's difficult because they also impact each other. So if for example, the Greenland ice has a tipping point and it just keeps melting and cannot go back to becoming bigger. Then that affects all kinds of other things like the Amazon forest and other ice shields that are then also tipping. Mm -hmm. So, and those tipping points, scientists are figuring out when they happen. 
and they're likely gonna a lot of them are likely gonna happen between like one and two degrees of warming mm -hmm. so that's why staying below 1.5 is is critical in terms of it's less likely for tipping points to happen maybe they already happened because once a tipping point happens, it's not like a switch. It, it It's gradually mm. then getting worse, right? Um, so that's why 1.5 is just important because, I mean, also the impacts we have already now at 1.2 degrees of warming are too much. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we just have to reduce as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what... I don't know. Let's start with like a little, let's try and find some good news. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I look at stuff like, um, where do you see that there's like some hopeful, mm. good impacts happening? And like, like things like um, the president of new, new again, new again, president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, who is like saying that he's going to protect the rainforest versus his like predecessor. Like as an outsider, not knowing a lot about Brazil, that sounds like a positive, hopeful maybe thing. Um, where, what like, yeah, what positive, hopeful areas do you see when it comes to like climate change or the environment? Yeah, I mean, what's what's been really hopeful to me is seeing that due to the Ukraine war and the, the problems with oil and gas in Europe that at least in Switzerland, I think in the rest of Europe as well, they are finally like really um, accelerating the renewables. Mm -hmm. Like in Switzerland, we now have um, renewables being built in the mountains, like on, on lakes that are used for hydro uh, um, hydropower anyways. Mm -hmm. So it's like I, when they said they're going to do this, I'm like, why haven't we thought about this before? Because you already have everything you need to get a lot of power into from from there to to the people because you mm -hmm. have hydropower there and all you need to do is put some solar panels on the lake mm -hmm. so but yeah places like switzerland it can take 15 years for um and wind mill a uh, wind turbine to be built because there's so much um like opposition to that and people can and in, in multiple steps, they can give up position and then the whole process is halted for another year. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that now through the energy crisis, the renewables are coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I froze during part of that. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping my internet's going to stay. <laughs> um. Okay, and now I want to know from you, maybe not the good news. Where do you think we're headed? What do uh, you? What is your like future prediction um, of where we're headed? Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we'll see. It's probably not gonna be that easy. Um, mm. a few a few days ago, um, I. Uh, the dad of a friend asked me and, and my boyfriend what we want to do for retirement after he asked us what we want to do in 10 years and we didn't know then he asked us what we want to do in retirement which yeah I'm in my 30s I haven't thought about my retirement mm -hmm. and luckily on that day I was in a not in a very pessimistic mood but mm -hmm. the the most realistic thing I would have to say about my retirement which would happen in like 30 years is well, I don't know what kind of retirement I'm going to have. Like, do we still have a civilization? I don't know. Maybe not. How much, how much, like, we definitely going to have bigger and bigger crises. How bad, like, how, how much do I have to fight for food when I'm mm -hmm. getting retired? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um my dad can now go skiing when he's retired I probably can't because there won't be any snow in Switzerland anymore mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's tough I think we're gonna have to get used to having these type of crises we have been living with in the last three years or two years mm -hmm. um because yeah as 
you know, food, all this, the climate gets worse. We're going to have more migration, more food shortages and um, the political climate, the geopolitical climate seems to tend more towards wars mm -hmm. than towards solidarity. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to, it's going to worsen from what we have now and, and just become a place where, yeah, we, we know we have peaked and we are, are declining into a life where, yeah, we have to, to, um, yeah, to deal with crises all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the food and water shortages, that's like one of like my main, con not main concerns, but one of the big concerns that I have, you know, looking into the future is, um, as well as, like you said, dealing with the, all the different kind of disasters that are going to keep coming. Um, and I, I know we talked about this a little bit last time, but I do find it really hard to be optimistic about the future. Um, so what would you say is, or are things that people can do now to like, to, to help <laughs> what can yeah. we do Brent? Francisco tell us what to do, <laughs> what to do? yes so I have to say I'm I'm more I don't have like emotionally I'm more optimistic or maybe more like ignoring the bad things that are likely gonna happen to us mm. which I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing if me ignoring that but it does help me in my current life that I don't mm -hmm. have uh, um, break down crying for no reason um, but I think one of the reasons is because I'm so busy working on this um, carbon dioxide removal project mm -hmm. so I see the progress we're making I'm focused on making progress I'm, I'm working like I, I've changed my job to something that works towards solving this crisis and that that really helps me because at least I know I've I've done I've done what I could do as a single person. Mm -hmm. But what I hate a little bit is, you know, people love to to tell talk about us. Um, so we just had a documentary being filmed about us. And I don't know when it's gonna come out. And and they're all about hope stories. And a lot mm -hmm. of these documentaries and news articles are they want to show people hey these are people who are doing something this should give people hope right give people positivity show that there's progress and I think that's good unfortunately I also see that the people who are consuming this they're just looking at this and they're like wow cool somebody's doing something everything is under control I, mm -hmm. I'm so inspired by this person and what do I do with this inspiration oh I just keep sitting on my couch mm -hmm. like I hate it when people say oh you're oh, what you're doing is so inspiring and I'm so inspired but then they don't do anything themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we are not yet enough people working on solutions there's still a lot of brain power a lot of work energy a lot of money spent on things that in the great scheme of things are not important for our survival like we don't need per se a new design for a new tv or you know mm -hmm. but what we need is solutions for the climate change and for the biodiversity loss so if we just had more people focusing on that rather than just selling more products that people already have and don't need i think that would be really useful so yeah mm -hmm. if you want to do something for climate think about what you do during your job during your free time and if you could spend more time on actually working on solutions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, now I'm losing another question. But I was thinking like in the in the terms of consumerism, because I mean, we're such a consumerist culture, like flipping that switch is going to be hard. But the companies that are looking at more sustainable products and things like that, is that actually helping or is that just something that's giving that feel good? Like, oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it depends. So, you know, a company like H and M, which is fast fashion and then mm -hmm. has those bio cotton, organic cotton labels. And you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm buying something that 
is um, that is more sustainable, that doesn't make much sense because at the same time, they are actually producing more clothes now than they did when they didn't have the organic cotton, mm -hmm. right? And we are, especially like just taking fashion as an example, we are buying or the average person is buying more clothes or new clothes a year now than they did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that actually is something that we need more, that we were like deprived of clothes 10 years ago. I don't think so. <laughs> don't I remember think that. that. No, <laughs> <laughs> the great clothing shortage. <laughs> yeah, but maybe like when like our parents were kids. Yes, mm -hmm. maybe you, you needed more clothes than they did back then. Or it was, was beneficial to have more clothes, but I don't think it's beneficial to go from 30 tops to 50 tops in your closet, which a mm -hmm. lot of people have. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot about thinking first, do I need something? Can I just go shopping in my own closet and find something that I forgot I have? Mm -hmm. And then once you go say, okay, yeah, really, I don't, I need this thing. It's essential then think about, okay, how can I buy it sustainably? Can I buy it secondhand? Can I buy sustainably made stuff? And then, yeah, your shirt will cost a bit more, but you're also not buying five of them, but you're just mm -hmm. buying one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a lot about us realizing how much do we actually need of something. Also of um, transportation and um you know, how often do we need to take the car or can we sometimes walk or bike and mm -hmm. yeah, change, change a bit our habits. Mm -hmm. And some of that though is like, is uh, also the way our communities are constructed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm a, great, so. <laughs> I'm a great example. I drive to and from work every day and, but it's literally, I don't have a train. I don't like the, I don't have a good public transport. I'm literally two blocks from the highway and like it's it's just how my neighborhood is designed and it doesn't the the uh the city designs don't always necessarily allow for the public transport or taking the or taking a, a bike around and I think um I've heard a little bit about this and I don't know if you've heard much about it or have any ideas about these 15 minute cities. I think that's what it's called. Yes. Yeah. What are your, um, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that? What, what is that about? Cause I see, also um, see a lot of opposition to 15 minute cities, which I don't necessarily understand, but. Yeah. I don't necessarily understand the opposition. Like the 15 minute cities for people who don't know what it is, is that where you live, you can walk or bike within 15 minutes to your work, to groceries, to your doctor. Like you have everything in reach, like also entertainment and a playground for your kids. So it's these small, like creating those small neighborhoods within the cities that you can get everything like a small town feel. And that way there is way less cars um, in the, in this, in this um, space. And uh, there's a lot more greenery and social spots and and places where people can encounter other people and and interact. I think it's a really good idea, especially if you look at um, North American um, cities and or maybe less cities, but suburbs and places like also thinking about Florida, where every street is like three ways in both directions. Like look, look at all that space. Mm -hmm. that the cars are taking up and the parking spaces in front of Walmart, et cetera. Like, what could you all do with that space? Mm -hmm. Like, we're giving mm -hmm. all this space to cars without even, like, it's it's our system, right? We're so used to have those cars having taken up the space and claiming this space over years and years, claiming more space, that we forgot that we could use this space for other things. Mm -hmm. And I actually really enjoy living here in Playa del Carmen. I was supposed to go live in Florida, but we decided to live here. And one of the biggest ups here towards Florida is that I don't need to have a car, that there are those little buses that I can take, that I can literally get anywhere by bike, mm -hmm. that I have tiny shops nearby where I can buy literally anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I live in kind of in a 15 minute city that way. And I love it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Oh, I was going to say someone that grew up in a small town. That's one thing I miss living in a bigger city. I'm like, I, I would love going back to that. <laughs> yeah, we have this like urban sprawl where like nothing is close by and you have to have that car mm -hmm. to get to, to yeah, anything. Th and then, I mean, you still spend like at least in Florida when I lived there for a year and I had a car anything I would go and get and do, I would still spend 20 minutes in the car to get there to my friend's house to, to do, do errands. So it's not even that it gets quicker, right? Mm -hmm. In the urban sprawl, it just means you spend a lot of time in a car, mm -hmm. which I would rather spend the same time walking or biking. Yeah. Because then I get exercise and fresh air and I, I see more stuff. And mm -hmm. Yeah. I spend a lot of time in my car. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to listen to a lot of podcasts. <laughs> yeah, but you can do that hike, walking. I can do that walking, too. <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't uh, don't like having to commute so long um, every day to get to work. Um, cool. Anything, you got anything else, Crystal? I can think of we covered so many things <laughs> I had my big list of things I needed yeah. to ask you <laughs> I mean I guess I there was so there is one thing where it's not um it's it's more about farming where like how we have the big farming um especially U.S. we have like states that are dedicated to the big farming and um I finally saw a headline that, that was acknowledging that the topsoil is not doing so great because of this big farming. But yeah, I'm curious on that and um too, like what are what are things people can do because we've we've come to rely on big farming. Is it a good idea to like for people to start growing their own, doing more of their own growing? Or what are some things that can be done? Because yeah, we especially in the US, big farming is uh it, a, it's a thing <laughs> it's it's a livelihood yeah. yeah and I mean yeah that's a that's a very good question but as you said it may not be a sustainable livelihood mm -hmm. that's going to stay on for a long time um in and it really depends on the person's situation like if you have a garden and you have a lawn that's just grass why not not and you have good soil why not start growing your own vegetables mm -hmm. that also helps if then civilization collapses and and mm -hmm. we have food shortages at least you have a few years of experience in how to to grow your own food and it's a lot of fun but not yep. everybody has the time or the space to do it i mean no, we, yes. we tried corn last year and it didn't go well so we keep it <laughs> we are like we're great at beans and peas and tomatoes and we tried yeah we tried corn but we're gonna try again <laughs> yeah, so it's good that you can um, experiment right with this while you're not yet relying on mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. Um, and then I think there's also, there are smaller organic farms in the States as well. And um, there's also places where you can um, buy vegetables and fruits and stuff that would normally not go that, that are, don't have the shapes or the, the sizes mm -hmm. that, that people want. So you mm -hmm. can also do all that kind of stuff, which maybe is even from big farming, right? But it's using their waste. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can go to farmer's markets, but of course that's more expensive um, often, um, um, you know, supporting smaller local farms. So it, it really it really depends because not everybody has the budget or the time. Like mm -hmm. if you are... Um, somebody who works two jobs and it's maybe a single mom who who has to turn every penny around to see um how to feed your family i think none of these options are options and you just have to do big buy the stuff from the big farming which is the cheapest mm -hmm. and the easiest mm -hmm. accessible yeah i remember talking to a friend and we we're talking about groceries and how much groceries cost. And this is when I was still like building my business. Not that I'm rich right now by any means. <laughs> I remember like telling her like, no, I, I buy my groceries at Walmart. And she's like, Walmart, why would you support Walmart? I'm like, listen, until I can purchase as per my morals <laughs> right now, I am purchasing as per my budget. And like, yes. it's true. It's like, I, I do need to feed myself and like, I would love to have, you know, I can't survive off of half of the 
food that I need just to buy uh, organic and sustainable because sometimes you just have to feed yourself. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I appreciate you saying that. Like sometimes mm-hmm. it is about the budget. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a guy who is doing some construction right behind me, apparently. Ah. I don't even know what he's doing. <laughs> um, okay. but, a, but another thing is like communal gardens. I think mm-hmm. it would be great if we had more communal gardens. I saw this awesome documentary about um, a Mexican girl. Like she, she is in the US and she is American, but her mom came in from Mexico. And, you know, she she does school and she has a job. And then next to it, her mom, who also has a full seven days a week job, like they're just trying to feed their family. They had they're in charge of this communal garden as well. And I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm so impressed that people who are like already working so many hours, like a 16 year old mm-hmm. working next to school, like all night. And she still has the energy to like start the communal garden project with the community but I think that's the ideal because Mm -hmm. then you're growing your own food you have community you're getting to know your neighbors you're yeah and and you you really create that community that you need to be resilient Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah there's one thing we see a lot of here in Vancouver is the community gardens which I really appreciate especially like it's one thing out here in the suburbs where I am there's a quite a big community garden but when you get into Vancouver proper, into the city, like to see um, to see so many of these like small community gardens, because obviously then once you get to the city, land is also at a premium. Um, you know, it's it it's a great thing to see that you know having people in there working away at the community gardens. And, and I just had another dog come in, so I'm about to have <laughs> chaos in my in here. <laughs> yes. Dogs are fighting. Yeah, community just, gardens. <laughs> this is this is where we're at. I'm, on, I'm going on mute for a second. <laughs> yeah, community gardens are something that here in Portland too. Um, I've seen around, so there. I just wish there were more of them. But yeah, it's the come coming from a very independent culture to learning how to be more of a community, and I think. Um, I think from what we've talked about today, it sounds like coming back to that community is what is really going to help in the long term, too, because when we're looking at ourselves as individuals, we're going to keep buying. We're going to war is more likely to happen and all these um, the fighting and the being against each other. But when we're when we're able to come together as a community and do things together, it sounds like that's the bigger step to creating change yeah and also Mm -hmm. for your security like if something bad happens to you having a community is the best thing to have Mm -hmm. like because you never know what you're going to lose maybe you're going to lose all your money you're going to lose your partner or whatever um but if you have a community which you have to build beforehand right then Mm -hmm. that community will help you through bad times but if you are just decided oh I don't need a community I I'm just gonna do life on my own then well if something bad happens you're on your own too Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah if anyone wants to read a good novel that kind of goes through this I have it right here next to me parable of the sower yes Octavia E. Butler like please just read it this novel okay I gotta I gotta get into this okay (laughs) um this was written like 30 something years ago near future dystopian it literally the the book starts in 2024 and to me it was like one of those um kind of dystopian type future novels that was like oh shit (laughs) it just feels very possible and realistic but one of the things that you just said that's really evident in the in the novel is just about having those communities and having people that you can trust um and and working together and that's how at least the first half of the book that's how their uh community that this that that's in the novel how they they work together families living together um, and working together to grow food um and to help each other out in the and i see that like echoing exactly what you're talking about in this book and parable of the sower octavia e butler 
highly recommend go read it right now. <laughs> After you finish this podcast, hit, <laughs> go, go to your local library because you don't need to buy it. You can go to the library and read it. Great book. <laughs> um, cool. Anything else? You're good. Um, <laughs> it was so good catching up with you, Francisca, and chatting with you as always. And uh, hopefully in a year and a half, we'll be talking again and talking and catching up and <laughs> finding out all of the hopeful, positive things that have come out of like your research and your work. And uh, all of society will have put the switch and changed and we'll all be on to a better path for the future. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, forgot what button to push. Okay. <laughs>